Enterprise in our Reston, Virginia office. And I have the distinct uh, honor of introducing our final speaker for the day, Michael Clark. <laughs> Michael Clark received his PhD in economics from George Mason University in 2011. He is currently an assistant professor at Hillsdale College, where his hard work and high teaching evaluations garnered him the Wallace and Marion Remlin Chair in Free Market Economics. Previously, he taught as a visiting professor for the MBA program at the University of Baltimore, where he earned the University of Baltimore School of Business's Top Teacher Award in 2009. While his passion lies in the classroom, his research has also been fruitful. He has been published in academic journals such as the Adam Smith Review, Reason Papers, and the Independent Review. Please join me in welcoming Michael Clark. What he didn't tell you is that I get a little nervous at these things and I need a little ramping up, so you guys got to kind of help me out, all right? So. All right. That's great. That's really, isn't that weird that all of you started clapping in sync with me and I didn't even really tell you what to do. What my talk is really going to be about today is to tell you that that's not even close to weird. What would be really weird is if after all of us leave here and go back to our respective homes and at some point next week we all happened, not on Zoom, not on FaceTime, but to be sitting in our homes and we all started to clap in sync. That would be really weird, right? My talk is about to tell you guys, try and convince you guys, that that happens every day all around us. There is coordination, there is outcomes that come about without a plan. And that's the real miracle. This miracle can stand as a metaphor for the economic reasons as to why a free society is different than a planned society. When you guys heard the speakers so far today, we hear these stories of communism and socialism. I don't care what, what it is, that's all planning. What ties all of those together is planning. When Hitler came to prominence, they were coming through and they actually had debates about like they hated the communists or they hated the socialists. We're not actually socialists, we're not this kind. Didn't matter what tied all of those things, fascism and communism, and it's all planning. That's the problem. And so I want to talk to you guys about not having a plan and yet still coordinating. So I have a bunch of stories that I want to tell you guys today. You guys usually like stories? So hopefully a couple of them will be good, right? One of them sticks with you and you can go home with it. Keep that story in mind, all right? The first story that I want to tell you guys is about what I call the evolution of music. I want you to think about what holds music as a form of entertainment, okay? So now what plays the thing, so like eventually we can get to like a CD. The CD is what holds the music. The CD player is what plays that CD. So what's, I want, I want the CD level, right? Like what's actually holding music as we have it? And so when we can, we can do this and say, hey, music as a form of entertainment, right? Let's go back like 1920s. Let's go way back. You, who, what holds it? We don't have records yet, folks. Really what holds it is other people. Like you had to go to concert halls and stuff like this, like big band and dancing and stuff like that, right? But then we get to the 50s and then what did we get? You got, some of you guys said it. What's in the 50s? Yeah, we get vinyl records, right? You guys know all about those now because they're hip. Right? Um, after vinyl records, what comes after vinyl records? Be careful. Oh, you guys are so young. Eight tracks. We had someone who knew it. So the 70s kind of have eight tracks. And then in the 80s, what do we get? You get cassette tapes. Yeah, some of your parents were babies of the 80s, I can tell. Uh, and then after that, we end up with CDs, right? That's like the evolution of what holds your music. Now, I grew up during this era, I'm like 40 years old right now, so I grew up CDs. When CDs came out, it was like awesome. They, they use lasers. 
And like their little gray, shiny things, right? Like they use lasers to play the things. It seemed like so futuristic and you're so cool. Like, oh, I don't use tapes anymore. I have CDs. Like it's like, oh, you know, like all this stuff. Well, I want to tell you guys, you weren't even born yet. But when we were in the 90s, we thought CDs were so futuristic, but we also thought we knew what was next. And what was next was going to be the mini CD. <laughs> okay? It was going to be the... And, you guys know this, this works for me because they've like rebooted this film series lately. You guys know Men in Black? Yeah. Right? Go watch the first one with Will Smith and all that or whatever. And they make reference to this. Like, oh, he goes something like, oh, I'm going to have to go buy the White Album again because this is what we're going to play our music on next. Like, we knew that would be next because it's like smaller. It still has the laser factor. It has all of these things or whatever. Right? And you guys know the answer to this in a way. But if you think about it, like I'm in the 90s, right? And I see this and I'm like, oh yeah, you know, innovation. We've, we've had big band and then we've had vinyl and then we've had eight tracks and then we had cassette tapes and we switched to CDs and what's gonna be next? And the actual answer was nothing. It was zeros and ones in this thing called a cloud. Like what the heck, what, what is that? Try going back to 1992 and talking to 10-year-old little Michael Clark and saying, hey, here's been the history so far. Big band, vinyl, eight-track, cassette tape, CDs. You know what's going to be next? Nothing. <laughs> I am going to have no, I, I'm not going to be like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Right? Like, for sure, that's going to be what happens. That's an amazing answer that we got to, but now, what do we think of that answer? We think, eh, yeah, it just makes sense, like internet, computers, fine, right? And so we have this evolution of music. We go back through our history, and we can see this evolution as we come through, and we eventually make it to this place where we have iPods and iPhones now and all of this stuff that hold MP3s. Like, my music that's on my phone right now is also in my house. Like if I went to my house, I don't have to take anything anywhere. Right? You know how many CDs I broke when I was in high school? Like my mom still is like having me pay off the debt, right? Like it, it's, it's not good. The idea behind this is that we don't understand the future until it's behind us. We make the past much more simple. There's lots of stuff in psychology I won't go into that make this so, so it's true. We always think the past was much more of an obvious progression than we have it from now going forward. And the problem with that is, when we think the past was obvious and simple, what do we think the future will be? Obvious and simple. Come on, guys, that wasn't that hard of a question. Obvious and simple. Yeah, right? Like, it's going to be obvious and simple. So when we think it's obvious and simple, doesn't having a plan to achieve that obvious and simple trajectory make sense? Sure it does. But the future is tough. One of my favorite tweets of all time uh, comes from this, this idea that we can think about. Uh, this is a quote from Niels Bohr. Uh, Prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. What I love about this quote is we actually don't have any idea if it's from him. It's debated as to who actually said this quote first. We don't even know the past, folks. <laughs> like, we don't, we don't even know the past, right? One of my favorite tweets reiterates this idea, right? So this is from Carol Nichols. She says, in 1998, this was a very, very real thing. You guys weren't alive then, but it was like, there was like, car, like commercials and like public service announcements that were like, don't go with strangers, like, and they'd have these little things where it's like, the guy who drives up by your school and offers you candy, like, don't go with him, you know, stuff like this. Like, it was like, obvious, you're an idiot. Like, we'd see these commercials or these ads or hear these talks, and you would do what you guys do in school when you hear something that's obviously just like, uh, and it would just be like, no kidding, right? Don't go with strangers. And it was really big to not meet people from the internet. This was a huge deal. Like it was like, do not meet people from the end. It's very dangerous. It's very scary. It was, it, there was all kinds of stuff around this, right? When my wife was in college, she was even like in a group that had like kind of this messaging when it came to like dating and other things like that. Like don't meet people from the internet. There's horror stories all around, all that kind of stuff. Follow up to the tweet. Like this is very true. 
That's crazy. Like Uber, you literally summon strangers to come and pick you up from the internet. You get a hold of them. Like these, these two things up here were duh, obvious, no brain kind of ideas. And 20 years later, not even, it's like, yeah, you do that all the time. Like, that's what you should do. I, like, people ask the question now, like, you don't use Uber? Like, what's wrong with you, right? Like, it's, it's a very different thing. Now, why is this of, why does this matter? Why is this important uh, to think about this unknown future? Well, part of it is what I said. If we think the past is so simple, then we think building the future is so simple. How does the future actually get built? How do we actually do it? I want to tell you guys that it's actually related to the little clapping game that I had you guys do at the start, that part of the answer is that there is not a plan. There's no one in charge. When I was up here and I got you clapping in sync, you were watching me to get in that rhythm. We didn't have it at first. Did you notice that? Everybody kind of wanted, some people were kind of doing it. Some people were like, just, yeah, go, man. Like somebody gave me a woo, I love that, right? But then eventually it was like, oh, I see. I see. We're doing this thing, the slow buildup thing. Yeah, we're doing this, right? And you all caught on. I was the leader. I was the plan. I was telling you this is what we're going to do. To move forward, we can't have the plan. So to talk about this, I want to first introduce you guys just a little bit uh, to my family. And I'm going to take you through a game that I've played with them a number of times because, well, I can't help myself. All right, so this is the Clarks here. It's actually the Clarks from about four years ago because that's all the pictures that I had of my family or of my family on my computer, but whatever. This is the Clarks. Um, so that's uh, the oldest son in the red uh, standing in front of me on that one picture is Connor, and then Addison's next to him, Ella, and then Keegan, and then my wife, Erin. So we're all doing great, right? This is my family. I've got four kids, love them a ton. I make them play this game, and now I'm gonna make you play this game. So I need some volunteers. I can only take five people up here, but I need some volunteers and you can win stuff. So I'm gonna go one, two, and then I'm gonna go to the back. Did some, nope, I fake three, four, five. Shoot, you guys are the only five that wanna raise your hands. Come on up. All right, come on up. You're gonna come right up over on this side. Right over there, next to the wall. We're gonna play an easy little game here. Like I said, my family, my kids have played this game. Uh, so I call this game the Alchin Maze. This is uh, what I actually think, as silly as this may be, is one of my greatest contributions to economics is coming up with a game that my kids could play. Um, but nonetheless, it's a very simple game. Uh, what you guys can't see kind of back there is that there's these cards that are laid down in front of this room. There's five rows, five columns. Okay, so there's five rows, five columns. Their goal is that they're going to try and get over here. Okay, they're going to try and get through the maze, essentially. Every time they get through the maze, I'm going to give them a little piece of candy. I thought this was going to be a really good incentive, and then I saw that you guys have like a M&M fountain out there. Um, so I don't know, misread that situation, but whatever. Like play such as though you want candy. I don't know. Um, so this is uh, from Armin Elchin's paper, uh, 1950 paper in the Journal of Political Economy, Uncertainty, Evolution, and Economic Theory. And he talked about how markets work in ways that even as economists who study it, don't really comprehend. We kind of get it wrong in our models sometime. Um, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna have them go through and they're gonna do a little step each time. And on the back of the cards, they're gonna have to bend down, pick them up. On the back of them, it either has like an X or it says get out of here or something like that. And if they get one of those, they have to start over. Okay, so you don't have to actually like sit down, but you have to go back to kind of like round one here. Uh, on the other side of it, if, if it says keep going, you'll take a step, you're still alive. And your goal is to get, keep going all the way past the, the last row. If you get past that, you can get a piece of candy. And then you can go do it again. And you can do the same path if you want. You can, do what, you can keep going, all that stuff. The rules of the game are pretty simple. You can only go one spot at a time. You can go forward, diagonal, backward, whatever. But you can't like skip three rows. You can't like do this. Right? You can only go one spot or one spot. right? Um, so just one spot at a time, you're going to come through. So I'll walk you through the very first one. I'll have you step up and grab the A right there. And so you just flip it over. And what does it say? So you would stay on that spot, and you'll end up looking for your next one. You come up and do B. She's out, so she has to put it back down. Yep, flip it back over. And then you're going to just step back. You'll come up and do C. Keep going. 
All right, so you'd be on that spot now. You do D. Keep going. So you're on that spot, and you do E. Keep going. Keep going. All right, <laughs> so you guys are all in those spots. Now, you don't have to start there anymore, right? Like, that would be really cruel if I just made you continually uh, go, go for that, you know, that spot over and over again. You guys can start anywhere that you actually want, okay? So you guys can go wherever you want after this, and I'm just going to say go, all right? Like, you don't have to wait for me to move you each turn. Does everybody understand the rules? Yeah, you think you got it? All right, go ahead. You guys can help, too, if you want. <laughs> Woo! I meant more like telling them how they're being stupid, but, you know, that works, too. Moral support's good. Moral support's good. Oh, we got one in the fourth row. Another one in the fourth row. Can they get to five? Eh. <laughs> Oh, we're getting a bunch to the fourth row. All right. There you go. Keep going. Here, you pick the next one for me. You want to pick the next one for me? One of you guys? And if you've made it through a couple of times and you know exactly where they are, you don't have to bend down anymore. You can just keep walking through. <laughs> Passes are by. All right, we got people rolling through. You guys watch their behaviors. I want you guys to kind of see what's happening here. This isn't just a game for them. It's a game for you. Are you guys frustrated with anybody? <laughs> Where did you make it through? You didn't make it through. I know this game too well. There's always one that wants to cheat. I don't get it. All right, let's give it up for them, guys. We got, we got what we needed out of it. Good job. Did anybody not get some candy? You, okay, you tried. You, here you go. You can, you can go with this. Grab a couple more for volunteering. Here, take the, you, you were the first one through. Take the bag, but you got to disperse it. You can't keep any of those ones. That's my rule. All right. Oh, now you want to play, right? Like, <laughs> now it's worth it. All right. So, what was frustrating about that game? Why were you guys like kind of stopping and like laughing at somebody every now and then, which is like a great game that I get to play where you guys like laugh at people? Why were you laughing? Why were you frustrated? Yeah. They just succeeded and succeeded and succeeded and then eventually like the other one, who, who was just, just like, was like, um, what was your name? Gabby. Gabby. Gabby was like, I'm finding my own way, man. <laughs> I don't care. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this my own way. She tried, right? Gabby, there was only one path. I'm sorry. Right? Every step in this process involved a little guess and check. It was a little trial and error. Did anybody that came up here have any prior knowledge as to how Dr. Clark lays out mazes? No. No one did. No one had any idea what the actual solution was, and yet you found your way through it. And once we had one person find their way through it, what happened to most the other people? Not quite all. They followed them. They copied it. They figured out this is the way that this works. 
This is a discovery process through a very simple maze but this simple maze can be multiplied millions of times over. And this is a metaphor for what happens in a free society. We don't know what the way forward is. We guess and we get kicked out of the game. We guess again and we get kicked out of the game. We watch others fail and we de decide not to do those same mistakes. And eventually we find our first foothold and we get to the second row. And then we guess again. And then we guess again until we figure out something that works. We get to the third row, and the fourth row, and the fifth row. This is how we learn our way forward. It is not by some miracle of somebody who is super smart out there who has the right way figured out. Because the right way is not something that can be known in that fashion. The right way forward is serving all of our fellow man, and we are all so different. So how do we ever come to uncover the cheapest ways to do these things, or the best ways to do these things, to move ourselves forward? The cognitive burden of figuring this whole thing out doesn't have to fall on any one of us at the starting line. The cognitive burden, the challenge, the mental challenge of figuring out our way forward comes from kind of a collective mind, from shared experiences of failure and of success, from all of us engaging in the ways that we can. There is no plan. There is only discovery of the future. We think some smart person that's well beyond us figured it all out when we think of entrepreneurial actions or some advance in society. The reality is that's not true. Our brains like to think of, as Plato put it, there being a ship of state. That our society has to be led by the greats, and that society is a ship that needs somebody steering the way forward. It needs someone at the helm. This just makes sense with most of life that we experience. You need somebody steering the ship if you want to get where you're going. The tradition of classical free economics is a tradition of explaining that that's actually not true when it comes to an overall economy. That's weird. Like, that's really, really weird. You would not say, hey, I want to have a car, go to Denver. And so you just say, well, no one should drive. Well, maybe now you would, right, with driverless cars, stuff like that. You got to have somebody at the steering wheel, right? Somebody's got to be there. The great man th thesis in innovation is that we have these great men that come along every so often and they give us these new inventions and it's just because they came and had some brilliant idea to move us forward. Look up the history of innovations and look at how many co-discoveries there are. Right? Look, look it up, like Thomas Edison in the light bulb. And you have all of these different things. There's always people right on the margins. Look at the Wright brothers. Go look at the Wright brothers and see all these other people. Like, what is it? Like, they sustained flight for like 40 seconds or something like that. Like, other people are, are doing these other things, right? Like, they're all kind of co-discoveries. Why? Because they made it to the fourth row. And now there's a bunch of people guessing about the fifth row. And whoever gets to that fifth row we say three cheers, and we write them into the history books. That's not how growth happens. It happens the way it happens in the Elchin maze, with small little discoveries that do take smarts and hard work. But it also takes a system where people are allowed to create and try to match what other people want. It's not from knowing the right way. We're limited in knowing that. We always think of ourselves as incapable of helping move markets forward. We are not that great man from the great man thesis. We're not going to be Thomas Edison. We're not going to be all of these you know, things or whatever. You think I could never do something like that. Well, I have a little background in psychology. And one of the things that I've always loved from psychology is this concept called survivorship bias. Survivorship bias can help us explain why we think kind of in the, this way. So during World War II, uh, researchers 
from the Center for Naval Analysis conducted a survey. They kind of did this study, I guess, um, of damage done to aircraft that had returned back to base. So ships, you know, flights go out, and then some of them come back, come back, and they look at the damage that has been done to these airplanes. They have bullet holes in them and stuff like that. And the point of this was to uh, figure out, like, okay, well, how should we change the way that our planes are made? And so they saw where the damage was being taken by the planes, and it turns out it looked something like this. And they said, okay, well, we're going to add extra armor there. Think about it. Those are the planes that made it back. The planes that didn't make it back, where do they have bullet holes? Everywhere else. We should put the armor everywhere else. Not there. Like, planes are good in the red areas. They can get shot there and they just keep going. Right? This is survivorship bias. We only hear the stories of those that made it out. So, like, I mean, think about this in a more extreme fashion. If somebody wins the lottery, would you ask them, oh, well, like, how do you get rich? Well, like, you're only talking to the ones that won. There's millions of other people who did not win, right? And so what happens, why does this survivorship ma you know, uh, idea matter? Why does this survivorship bias matter? Well, because like every business book that has ever been written is basically survivorship bias. It's like, here's how you do business. This is how you build a successful company. This is how I did it, and this is the end of the answer. Why is it then that business books have to be written every year multiple times over. Because that was how they did it through their own little Elchin maze, which requires specific context, nuance, because people are different, and different business settings require different things. You can't just plop some answer onto a different situation and expect the same thing to come out if the situation is slightly different. That's a weird thing. Like, we think, oh, we figured it all out. We, we get through this, that we have to be super smart and know what the answer is. But the reality is exactly the opposite is true. We can't know what the answer is. The argument for freedom relies on us not knowing where that freedom can take us. That's weird. It's also hard to argue for. This is part of the reason to answer some of the questions that you guys had uh, after Phil's amazing talk. Like, so gr such a great talk, guys. Take notes, jot it down, do more research. He's amazing. One of you guys asked him, like, why is Marx so famous still? Freedom's hard to sell. It's not intuitive to us. What's freedom going to do for us? Not sure. That's my sales pitch to you, to you guys today. I'm not sure. What's the sales pitch of socialism? Here's the plan. This is what will happen. This is what will happen. Like, if I said to you guys, hey, uh, I'm a leader, and I'm basically going to take my hands off the wheel, and let this country just drive itself, baby, and, uh, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. Don't know where we're heading, but vote for me. And then, you know, somebody else gets up here and is like, all right, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to make the entire world equal and utopian. Like, you're going to be like, wow. Right? Like, there's not going to be any unemployment. Uh, everybody's going to have at least $20 an hour jobs, every, you know, all that is, oh, and I can give you free health care, too, by the way, and free education. It'll be the best education. Why not? Right? Um, like, this sounds great. It's a plan. It's a structure. It's a way forward. Freedom relies on us not knowing that way forward. One more important lesson that I want to share with you guys from the Elchin Maze that's really important to this is another thing that really helped. Uh, that, that really helps in that game is variety. So I've played that game before with just one person, just kind of as like a little torture experiment so I could tell them, tell it, talk about it when they, you know, I do this. It takes a long time. Because even the people that made it through quite quickly, they saw a couple of mistakes from other people. I even heard the, the guy who got through first tell somebody who was behind him, no, 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 A5, A5, trust me, trust me, right? Like helping out. People can see what happens. Like long ago, guys, uh, you know, we had this, uh, we had like the, the, actually if we go back to the, uh, what was it called? The, what was the original iPod? 
right? After the iPod, we made it smaller because like electronics, smaller. We did the iPod Nano, right? And then what did we do? We did an iPhone, which got bigger, but it was a phone too. And you could like do other stuff on the internet. That was awesome, right? Well, like the next thing that we were going to do and what Apple did is they said, yeah, we're going to make this thing like way too big and take away the phone part. And everybody thought it was stupid. Like there's clips from like Saturday Night Live and all this stuff where they like make fun of the iPad. Because, I mean, think about it. You make electronics smaller, more compact, all that. They took away the phone and made it bigger. That's dumb. And actually now tablets are all over the place, right? <laughs> like they're all over the place, right? Because it wasn't a bigger phone without a phone. It was a smaller computer. That's weird. Like we didn't know that in advance. What makes the Elgin Maze, what makes the Elgin Maze game important, or one of the things that makes you successful, is variety. Is having multiple people. We need variety to discover these other ways forward. Julian Simon called us and our different ideas and our different motivations the ultimate resource. Tap into it. Julian Simon applauds Gabby, says, heck yeah, we need Gabby. Because what if there would have been a different way? What if there would have been a different way that got us much, much farther? We need that variety, that sticking to it. There's always one. It's bizarre. But we have that in our spirit that sometimes it's just like, you know, I'm going to do this my own way. And others who say, hey, this is easy. This is my own way. This is like the path here. That variety helps us find the multiple dimensions, the different ways of doing things. I teach at Hillsdale College. It's a more conservative, uh, rigorous school, very good school. If you guys are interested in going there, you better get some good grades. It's a challenge, all this kind of stuff. But by all means, look me up, right? Come there. I do things differently at Hillsdale College than most other professors. I teach a lot more, I, it's, I, I play music when you guys come into class and play games and all this other weird stuff. But the market test at Hillsdale has said, you're Gabby, but you found a way through. And so I get to be there. I'm, I stuck there, right? It, it worked for me. We all have these creative ideas and it can be in as small of things as just on the margin, how do you teach a class? Or on the margin, how is it that you uh, are actually like doing whatever it is that you're doing, right? Like if you're bussing tables, start there, be better at it. Because that work ethic and that gabbiness to us eventually pays off. That's part of what you're learning when you are in those jobs, to be dependable, to do things, but to try and figure out better ways to do it and how do you work with other people. You are the ultimate resource. Our ability to be creative, our ideas and our ability to come up with solutions like nothing for what's next in the evolution of music is what's so inspiring to what we are doing as a society. Each individual fits into this process. Each individual helps make these inc incremental contributions through the Elchin maze, where we make these discoveries that make things cheaper or even invent new things for other people. A market system where we don't know what is next engages all of us, and it allows us to contribute what we can to other people. In this Victims of Communism session that you guys have gone through, to end us, I want to talk about the blessings of freedom, the awe of the profit and loss system that rewards others for helping people resolve their own problems. I want to bring this back to my family fairly quickly here if I can. We had a lot of talk actually about the medical field from your other speakers, talking about how uh, Queen Anne, you know, all of the problems with her children, like they didn't survive. And we had the discussion in socialist countries, what about like free health care? And the remark was, well, you had health care, but you had to wait. There was a cost to it, but it was in time. Well, one of the other things that I would argue, um, that's a, those are totally right answers, great answers, right? 
is that not only in a socialized country do you have to wait, but there's no incentive to innovate. There's no piece of candy for somebody to make it to row five. There, there's no incentive to like generate things forward and hence we could get stuck at the level of Queen Anne's healthcare. But in a system where we do not have such things, where we do have the incentives, we've had incredible advances and for that, I feel incredibly blessed to be in a country that is very free, relatively speaking. So my family, and more specifically, how my family started to grow, is a story very similar to this in the medical field. So my wife there and my oldest son, Connor, when Connor came into the world, I lived in Northern Virginia. It is very hot in Northern Virginia in the summers. Uh, it was the middle of summer. I had time off. I was in between like teaching gigs. It's the summer, so I totally took things off. My wife and I basically were the first people like in our cohort from family to friends and everything to have kids. Like so to me, like nobody had had a kid before in human history, which I understand is a ridiculous statement, but like I had never been a part of it. I didn't have like a sister who had had a kid. I didn't have, I was the first one of my friends married, all of that. I, I was just like, I don't know what I'm doing here, right? But we went to all these doctors and all this stuff, but I was a nervous wreck. And we'd go and we'd walk the malls in Northern Virginia, because AC, and then we'd go to these movies. Do you guys know the Twilight movies? <sighs> <sighs> like, whatever one was, I think it was like Twilight 2 was out, we went to it three times. <laughs> because we did not know what else to do. Like, we, we just didn't know what else to do with ourselves, right? So one night, we get home from Twilight 2. My wife says to me, I have a really bad headache. And I am, I'm a really good husband. So I tell her, just go to bed. Right. <laughs> and she goes to bed. And she wakes up the next morning and says, oh, man, if anything, my headache is worse. I'm really not feeling that great. And I didn't remem remember anything from any of the classes that we took and all of this kind of stuff. But she did. She remembered one thing that, hey, if you have a headache, if it doesn't sleep, sleep off, then like, you should probably call your doctor or whatever. So she told me that. I Google it. I'm like, eh. oh, yeah, you're right. I call the doctor. Right? Doctor says, yeah, why don't you come into the hospital? So I was nervous before this. When I hear those words, you guys, I'm not built for this stress. I, 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 you guys had to clap me on the stage, OK? <laughs> I, I was a wreck. We got there, took some readings, all of this kind of stuff. Long story short, they say, there's some issues going on. Your, your wife. Um, has preeclampsia, which is an issue with blood pressure and all that stuff, and a few other issues that are kind of going on. Um, your son is probably good. And then that, the sentence ended. And my world stopped. And I was like, and? And that was, there was nothing else there. And they said, we have a specialist who has trained in like her residency and her, her research a lot was in emergency C-sections with preeclampsia. She knows what she's talking about, we'll, we'll bring her in. She gets there in less than 10 minutes. She starts going through this stuff and she says, we have two options. You're okay, you're fine. It's not a big deal. I, I can see we're okay, but we do have to act. We have two routes. We can try and speed up natural birth or we can go and do a C-section. My wife, crazy, says, let's do the natural route. And I'm like, huh, okay. So we start ramping up the natural birth stuff, right? Whatever, she's getting all this stuff. And about 30, 40 minutes into it, they're just getting frustrated, getting frustrated. The doctor that got called in, Dr. Hashimi, I still remember her, God bless Dr. Hashimi, right? Dr. Hashimi pulls me out to the hallway and says, hey, I, I understand what's going on here. I know this wasn't her plan. I really think you should try and convince her that we should go the C-section route. I think that's much safer for her. She's okay but she's much more okay if we go the C-section route. And so I am like a very like modern male, female, relational, whatever, but man, I was about to do like this, like, okay, misogynistic woman, let me tell you, like, and it's just so out of my character, right? Like, and I'm just like, so I like get the nerve up and I, I round the corner and I remember I turned into the room and I looked at her and she goes, let's do the C-section. I was like, oh, okay. I was like, whoo, okay, right? <laughs> 30 minutes later, I had a child. 40 minutes later, they told me my wife was clear. 
That's crazy. Like, I had access. Guys, I was a grad student. I had negative dollars to my name. <laughs> negative. I went first year, no funding. They tell you not to do that. It's too expensive. Nope. Plowing ahead. Negative dollars to my name, and I had access to that. Queen Anne did not. If it were not for the innovations through an Elchin Mays-like process, through a situation where we did not know what the right medication, what the right medical responses were, but instead, through a little bit of science, a little bit of profit and loss, a little bit of trial and error, and discovery of unknown things, of things like nothing being the answer for what's next in music, and of things like, hey, maybe we can do this in medicine, and that might save some lives. My story changed. If it weren't for that, I would not have this guy. He has such an amazing little smile. I would not have her. She is incredible with her wit. I cannot believe the creativity that this girl has. I might have him, but he would not be the same because I would not have her. I would not be here. I would not be here. But I lived in a society that allows for discoveries of unknown things as opposed to the plans of some who consider themselves elite. Understand the inspiration that freedom is. Understand what we can get. A free society is an unplanned society. It allows for us and our creativity to play millions of little Elchin Maze games. It allows it for us to discover little steps forward. It allows the best in, us, uh, the best in each of us to be given to others. You don't go into what you're terrible at. You go into what you are good at. And we get to give that to the rest of the world. It encourages all of us to help resolve other people's problems. Let me say that again. It encourages all of us to help resolve other people's problems. Your problems are hard enough for you. A free society encourages other people to help you out. This is amazing and it deserves your awe. So I challenge you guys, when you leave here, after hearing these incredible stories from the speakers that you heard this morning, I hope that you understand how true and personal they actually are. But I also encourage you to not just go forward with a negative view of planning and of socialism and communism. I encourage you not just to understand that there are horror stories on the other side. They are. They definitely are. You should not forget those. But there is also tremendous stories on the side of freedom. See the hope and beauty in what freedom can create. Thank you, guys. All right, we'll open it up to uh, Q&A. Uh, raise your hand if you have a question and state your name and school. Um, my name is Sarah. I'm from Buchanan High School. And my question for you is, you mentioned that often the people who like actually like just make the discovery, like make the fifth step, are the ones who are remembered. But there are examples in history like Scranton. Um, it was actually like a little group that discovered how to, um, like, I think it was the iron that they I'm not made? familiar, but sure. <laughs> so why do you think, like, that certain historians remember, like, the groups as well, uh, as opposed to most people who only remember the main person? Yeah, the, so, like, the fifth step, is, so, the, like, this game is very limited. The reality is this game is way wider and way longer. And we get these little demarcation points like a fifth step. But the fifth step is like the iPod. And we're like, yay. But like there's building upon that, right? And then we give credit at other kind of monumental stages along the way. And every now and then, sometimes it's just like the inspiration. So like we remember Adam Smith as economics. Well, he was like, I mean, he wasn't the first step. I shouldn't say that. But like, he was like a first step. And then we built from there. 
um, he was, in a sense, a fifth step to a different game, and then we kind of move on from there. Um, so there's lots of different ways that we end up remembering these things. But I think more important from what I was trying to say to you guys is that's kind of the way that we view progress. Like whatever with the historians, we kind of view it as somebody super, super smart just figured all of this out. And that is true. But there was four other people who were super, super smart who were figuring it out in a different way and they failed and we don't know who they are. If we just relied on the super smart people to figure it all out and we just had the one, we don't go anywhere. It's actually the weeding out. It's the institution in which those efforts are made that actually create the benefits for what we get. And that's kind of weird, right? Like, that's interesting. So the, the game itself was actually based on this metaphor from Armin Elchin who said, imagine you're like driving from whatever it was, like Chicago to Dallas, and there's a bunch of different roads that can take you there, but only one of them has gas stations on it. Like, how, who gets to, the, to, to Dallas, from Chicago to Dallas? Well, the people who ever took that happened to take the road that actually got there. Is it because they're super smart? No, they just happened to get there. Like, maybe they thought that was the best idea, but really it wasn't. If you switch the gas stations to another road, other people would have gotten there, right? So the idea is it's the institutions, it's the setup of our preferences interacting with other people of like, what do consumers want? Of what, what do we want interacting through a setup where we have that institutional arrangement that kind of weeds things out. That's really the study of economics, at least properly done. Right, is understanding those institutional arrangements that best lead to that coordination. So I, I don't care as much about how the historians really view it. It's the idea behind, that's kind of how we view progress. We're messed up when it comes to progress. Um, there's, like I said, I kind of have some background in psychology and there's all kinds of stuff towards this um, where we, we basically have like this hindsight bias where we make the, ha the past so much more simple and we think the way forward is really obvious as well. Um, our, our, a lot of our political ideas as to knowing the right answer, you should, if you think you know the right answer, you should, you should pause. <laughs> Gabby. Hi, I'm Thank Gabby. Thank you so much, Gabby. I'm the dumb kid who couldn't pass your test. <laughs> <laughs> You did a great job. You were exactly what I needed. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, in your personal opinion, do you think that America will go onto a socialist path? path? Uh, my personal opinion, uh, it's probably clouded by all kinds of uh, weird context of people I'm around. But I'm in a free market uh, department at Hillsdale College. I think we have one of the best economics departments for the undergraduate level in the world uh, for teaching economics. The one thing I would say is that we have a fair amount of pessimists that are super concerned like you are, and I think you should be concerned. I think there should always be, I, I used to coach sports, and my saying would be, you should have a healthy fear of your opponent. No matter who you're playing, you should have a healthy fear of who you're playing. I think too many of us in the movement of freedom have an unhealthy fear of the movements of socialism. Because if it gets so unhealthy, there is no way forward What's the point? It might take, it, you might even be wrong by saying it's, you know, like, hey, there is paths forward. We might make it there or whatever. But the only way to actually get there is to tell yourself that lie. The only way to have that truth is to kind of tell yourself that lie. Like, I played college basketball. I'm 6'1". That's not that tall in basketball, guys, whatever. The only way I got there was an irrational belief that I could, because I really shouldn't have ever got there. But because I believed in it, I worked my butt off, got all this stuff, right? Like, that is kind of like the case for freedom. The case for freedom never made sense. Think of the United States of America prior to, say, 1750, and then say, hey, where will we be in 1800? Where they ended up was nothing short of a miracle. I think us moving to a relatively more free country over the next 40 years, 50 years, is far more likely than the jump that they made. And it happened. So I do think you should have a fear. I think you should have a healthy fear. Uh, the, the stories that you guys heard today, I'm like so blown away by the stories from Ukraine and of Pol Pot 
when I was in undergrad, I read those, not even stories, I read those realities that existed somewhere out in the world. And I asked myself, how in the world could that possibly happen? And I looked at the psychology of it, and I looked at the, all of this, and I read Hayek's Road to Serfdom, and I read all of this other stuff, and I started to get to a point where I said, how does this ever not happen? Like, I was very dark about my hope for the world because those are very scary stories. And yet, we've made it some, right? There's a quote, I forgot who it is, but says, how, who can look behind us and see nothing but success and claim that nothing but failure lies ahead? We have had tremendous success in the United States. Are there things to complain about? Are there things to fight over? Yes. But I think we move forward. Adam Smith said, you know, markets can overcome hundreds of, in, of impertinent regulations and still move forward. I think we can keep making that fight and we have the principles that we're holding on to. And we have people like you. We have people like my students at Hillsdale College that try and defend liberty. We have people at FEE that are pushing this stuff forward and truth is on our side. I think it will happen. Thank you. Any other questions for Michael? No? All right. We can give it up one more time for Michael Clark. Thank you, guys. It's been tremendous. This is a great event for you guys. I hope you guys cherish it. I am like so appreciative that I got to be here with you guys. So I just thank you guys a whole bunch and hope you guys enjoyed it.